Hey, Im Alltag entdecke ich so viele Firmen und dann schaue ich mir das an. Was machen die? Wo stehen die? Stericycle, ein Zulieferer für Krankenhäuser und Hotels. Ähm, ich schaue mir dann den Chartverlauf an und gucke, was sie verdient haben. Und wie es denn so geht. Ich finde das total spannend, so im Alltag zu schauen, hey, was ist los mit so einer Firma? Sogar im Müll kannst du Firmen entdecken. Wenn du im Müll... Zum Beispiel entdecke ich oft ganz, ganz viele Kartons von Amazon. Und dann denke ich mir, Mensch, das muss ja super laufen. Also der Müll ist eine Riesenfundgrube für Aktienideen. Meiner Meinung nach. So. Hier wird überall gebaut, das ist der Wahnsinn. Hier entsteht ein neues Hochhaus. Im Finanzviertel New Yorks ist, da, ist ein Baumboom, Bauboom ausgebrochen. Äh, ich weiß gar nicht, wie die die ganzen äh, Häuser füllen wollen. So, jetzt gehe ich zu meinem Gemüsehändler und kaufe mir ein paar Früchte. Und ein paar Tomaten und so, alles im Angebot. Die meisten Sachen kosten ja nur einen Dollar. Das ist echt äh, unschlagbar günstig. Hier siehst du die Müllentsorgungsfirma Stericycle im Chart. Der Kurs ist ganz schön eingebrochen. Sie machen eben äh, Müllentsorgung für Krankenhäuser, für Verwaltungen, für Daten, für gefährliche Stoffe. Ähm, ob ich sie kaufen würde oder nicht, keine Ahnung. Ich habe sie nicht. Ich mache hier auch keine Anlageberatung. Bitte denk an die Risiken selbst. Weil also das passiert, wenn deine Aktien abstürzen, sowas wie Team Viewer oder eine andere Aktie nach einer Gewinnwarnung und sie um 30% einbricht oder 50%, ähm, wie viel man ist ja auch brutal eingebrochen. Die Leute bekommen Angst und verkaufen, anstatt zuzukaufen. Ja, also hier siehst du äh, Team Viewer komplett als Desaster die Aktie und viel man hat auch ganz schön gelitten, nicht so arg, aber tolle, interessante Aktien. Hey, ich war mit Freunden dann am Strand, Montauk, äh, auf den Hamptons, ist äh, ganz schön kühl geworden. Äh, oh, aber das Wasser ist immer noch ein bisschen warm, muss man sagen, erstaunlich warm. Ja, wir waren in so einem Hotel mit Freunden, ganz einfach, glaube ich aus den 70er Jahren oder so, ein paar Tage untergebracht und haben einfach den Strand genossen, die Ruhe, meilenweit Sand, äh, Strand, toll zum Relaxen. Hier war einer, ein Promi, der ist hier mit seinem Brett raus, und da hat ein Security Guard mitgehabt und der hat den die ganze Zeit überwacht und auf ihn aufgepasst, so eine Art Bodyguard, ein persönlicher Bodyguard. Und äh, ich habe äh, eine Vermutung, wer es sein kann, äh, bin mir aber auch nicht 100% sicher. Hier siehst du den Bodyguard, der hat hier aufgepasst und die ganze Zeit äh, einen Blick auf den geworfen. Äh, immer dabei gewesen. Ich habe das beobachtet und hier kam der Promi zurück. Äh, ein paar Leute haben den gleich erkannt, aber ich weiß es nicht. Es ist es vielleicht der Sean Mendes? Der geht ja auch gerne schwimmen an den Strand, Sänger und hat einen super Body. Äh, kann sein, keine Ahnung, er ist auch öfters in New York. Äh, dann waren wir hier essen. Hey, in, auf den Hemden sind so viele Superreiche. Da ist alles so teuer, die Immobilien, ein paar Millionen. Da kriegst du unter einer Million gar kein Haus, keine Wohnung. Hier hat einer geangelt. Das sind auch viele, viele Prominente. Das ist unglaublich. Äh, auf den Hemden ist halt die, die reichen New Yorker, die gehen da noch am Wochenende halt hin. Gerade im Sommer, auch im Herbst. Ähm, weil man hat da seine Ruhe, die Natur pur. Ähm, und äh, also das war der Blick äh, von dem Balkon, von dem äh, Motel. Da kann man also wirklich schön in Ruhe das Jahr fast ausklingen lassen. Ähm, 
paar Stunden von New York Manhattan entfernt. Ist auf jeden Fall eine Reise wert, ein kleiner Kurzurlaub wert. Das war der Balkon von dem Hotel. Man kann da, die haben auch so Mini-Küchen da drin, da kann man sich auch was kochen. Wir waren ein paar Mal essen, ähm, haben uns auch mal einen Snack mitgenommen. Ähm, kann einfach, ein paar, wir sind zum Frucht, äh, Früchte ein paar gekauft und haben gesnackt auf der Terrasse. Hier gibt es auch einen schönen Leuchtturm in Montauk auf den Hamptons. Der ist auch sehr bekannt. Der Max Frisch hat ja eine, ein Buch darüber geschrieben. To the Moon. Mit den Aktien oder Bitcoin. Don't tell mom. Jetzt wieder zurück in Manhattan. Hier siehst du die Yachten in Battery Park City, wo die Superreichen sind. Ähm, so nice. Also die haben sich da die Markise runtergemacht, damit sie nicht gesehen werden. Äh, da dürften auch viele Prominente sein, die hier mit ihrer Yacht stehen. Ich äh, interview als Leute, vor allen Dingen halt über Zoom. Manchmal treffe ich auch Vorstände in Manhattan, trotz äh, Corona. Aber ich bin ja geimpft und der, der Interviewpartner auch. Also Vorstände auch aus Silicon Valley mache ich. Und dann habe ich einen Mean Manager interviewt. Und der war Milliardär in Kanada, der Rob McEwen. Ähm, ich zeige euch das. Das Interview habe ich gemacht äh, für The Market, äh, das Schweizer Börsenportal. Hello. Hi Tim, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Rob. Yeah. Uh, great. I hope uh, we, we can uh, record this uh, interview. Of course, yes. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah, let's, uh, le let's start. Um, what do you think about um, the gold price? Everything goes up like meat, coffee beans, used cars, homes, um, but gold is very weak this year. The S&P 500 is up three, 33% within 12 months. Um, yeah, gold, it, yeah. Well, I, I, I think, well, one right now we're in a, a seasonal low for gold. Uh, there's a seasonality or a, every year there's a cycle where gold ebbs and the demand ebbs and flows and we're in one of those low points i would expect it to improve once uh people come back in september uh, we've seen covid took away our summer last year and it's been relaxed a bit and i think a lot of people <laughs> portfolio managers just decided i'm going to take some time off and be with my family and um but There, normally, you have a lull in the summer, and um, I'm very positive on the price of gold, as, as I am on the price of copper. Uh, I think with the the incredible amount of monetary stimulation that has occurred, in, um, brought on by the government's response to COVID, and that globally, we're in a position we've never seen the money supply expand as fast globally as it has done in the last year. Um, and with coupled with low interest rates, it's just uh, it's been a place where people have gone into the broad market. Uh, they speculated in real estate there. It, there's no place to put your money right now other where you can get any sense of a return. And the market's been providing that. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to be, investors don't seem to be thinking there's anything to be worried about at the moment. Yeah. Central banks are controlling the direction of the economy, at least. <laughs> yeah. Short term. And, uh, so overall, there's a lot of speculation with crazy stocks and uh, like uh, some uh, cinema companies like AMC and GameStop and uh, Bitcoin and stuff. How, how do you see that? Like uh, gold, gold is not anymore in the focus. Like, No, it's passe. At yeah. least that's what the market's saying. Is it's yeah. no well, longer relevant. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, centuries of history has just been erased. Uh, they say gold is no longer something you need. You need something new, something innovative. And yeah. uh, I mean, the cryptocurrencies, uh, I like, a, like Bitcoin in that. I just think 
Well, how many currencies in the world have run like that? Currencies aren't viewed as an investment. I mean, it might be diversification, but you don't have the type of escalation in value. Um, so I look at the crypto as sort of, it's like uh, an American Express check. I don't know if you remember those, but uh, it's a very expensive way of transferring money uh, when yeah. you look at this. And once you get it publicly trading, some of that um, imperfect market making and price escalation, I'll call it manipulation, will disappear because um, it's been a very closed, almost uh, over-the-counter market for quite a long period of time. Um, the other thing that's somewhat disturbing about the crypto market is the degree of leverage that can be used on these small over-the-counter markets. Um, whenever we've seen it in the past where you could use <laughs> 50 to one, 100 per, to one um, leverage, there comes a day when someone fails and, and the system, it sends shockwaves throughout. Um, and you don't have the gold robberies that are starting to happen <laughs> in the crypto space. What was it just recently? 600 million seem to have been taken out of it, certain people's pockets. Yeah. Uh, and Mount Gox was 400 million. Um, yeah. That's a lot of money to lose. That's and you have a lot of scam artists. A lot of those new currencies are like just based on a, on a, on a Ponzi scheme. And yes. Yeah. And it, it's, sort are, of like, it, it's like the letters you get from Nigeria saying, <laughs> you know, I, I've worked with the government or my uncle just died and your name, name is close and I'm writing to you because you're a, you seem like a nice person. And I go, why are they writing to me? Don't they have a brother, sister, mother, father, uncle, aunt, good friend that they'd like to confer this favor on first? Yeah. But, and it's uh, just a fee to be paid. And then you get all the money transferred, right? Yes, <laughs> exactly. So yeah. I, I think it's a modern day Nigerian letter. Yeah. So where do you see the gold in, in the next couple of years? Like, let's say two years, five years? Higher. That's rather vague, but uh, I think it could be quite a bit higher um, just because of all the, the money printing that's taken place. Um, yeah. It's made cash very valueless at the moment. Yeah. You want to spend it because it's depreciating value. Yeah. But as some critics say like gold is something there is really no physical real demand. Okay. For jewelry and a little bit of electronics and stuff, but it's not really that huge. It's mostly like, it was like just to store value. Uh, you had it in a, in a safe or so uh, uh, for stability and uh, to sleep well but there was not real demand like copper is different uh, how much is needed really of that gold in the world like physically like well the central banks are buying again mm -hmm. so they obviously think they need something behind their currency some reserves um, and that's a big change in the last five years that they yeah. started buying yeah mm -hmm. And it does still, people still like it for jewelry. It is used in electronics. Uh, some of our industrial uses are coming out for a lot of telecommunications, satellites. So, yeah. but it, it, it's essentially a reserve currency. Yeah. And when you look at the majors, the Newmonts and Barracks, Agnico, Kinross, and so on. They, they seem like to be really cheap on, uh, they're almost value stocks. And it doesn't happen that often. When you look at some PE ratios, they are like 12 or 14. Some pay a nice dividend and uh, they consolidate it. They cut costs, they cut their, uh, their borrowing and the, the balance sheets are much stronger and nice cash flows. But, but uh, how do you see those majors like as, as a value investment? 
As you said, I mean, they've really improved their balance sheets uh, with the, they've greatly benefited from the, you know, the improved gold and silver prices. Um, the treasuries are filling up, they're paying dividends. Um, I think people are waiting for them to start looking at their reserves and resources and that as they've become bigger, they're going through those faster. Um, they focused primarily on the juniors in the last few years, not big investments, but I think they're gonna have to start reaching down into the intermediates and buying. And maybe some people are saying, well, it's not as sexy as the technology area. And they're probably gonna spend the money the way they've done in the past. And they're gonna be making acquisitions in the mid tier. Um, yeah. But that, that was where the go-to money was, went to when, yeah. when the gold price was going up. And I guess they're just, again, it's reflecting the disinterest in gold because yeah. these companies are large enough to be a reasonable investment for portfolio managers. Yeah. They have the liquidity. They, they over, but they paid too much, right, in the past. Uh, yeah. That's what happens when you have too much money in your pocket. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> the temptations are large. And the... Yeah. And, but then they took over the large ones, uh, like Newmont took over Gold Corp. How do you see that deal uh, for $10 billion? Did they do well integrating it? Um, I think the, the market's looking at it and saying it, it wasn't as smooth a transition as it was billed to be. Uh, there were some operating issues uh, in the Gold Corp portfolio. Um, sometimes uh, your enthusiasm carries you away and blinds you to some of the issues that might be lurking inside. Um, yeah. And but they are the biggest. Yeah. At the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so overall, how would you grade the deal and, and the transaction? Like from one to 10, 10 would be the best. Like if you would have to rate them like a teacher, like. I didn't really think about it a lot. Okay. And haven't. Okay. And one of those uh, majors, would you buy one of those and think it's a good investment or you don't like them? <laughs> <laughs> It, it depends on your, your investment profile. I, I tend to favor the juniors and the explorers. Uh, I just think there's more explosive growth that can occur there. You sacrifice liquidity, um, but I think the gains are larger there. Um, they've already had their run. Yes, they will go up if the gold price goes higher. And yes, they'll make more money. And so if you're a conservative investor wanting exposure to gold, those are good names to look at and consider. Yeah, and which one would be your favorite of the larger ones? Um, I'd probably go with Barrick. Barrick, why mm. is that? I just like the way Mark goes at uh, his um, management of the company. He yeah. may made it very lean, <laughs> mean. Um, Agnico's done a good job too. Um, so far, Barracks seem to have had the winning hand in Nevada. In Nevada. And Barrick took over Rand Gold and the Rand Gold CEO became the CEO of Barrick, right? Yes, Mark Bristow. Yeah. That's who I was speaking of. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and he, he was strong in, in Africa, right? And uh, Rand Gold. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I thought that was a good, it was a good deal for Rangold. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, Mark's a no nonsense manager. And okay. Okay, and uh, yeah, when you look at nationalism, because Africa, we spoke, and uh, we have South America. You have investments in Argentina. 
is it dangerous? Like there is a little trend to nationalism. You also work in Mexico, that countries, you know, lock themselves up a little bit. You see it now in Corona too, that that has a real reason with the virus, but there is a, a, a trend that countries want to be staying on themselves and, and not to share their resources or tax them higher and, and make everything harder to do global business with. Mining can be a very important part of the revenue of certain countries. Um, yeah. It's usually owned by foreign interests that don't have as many friends in the country. And there's not a lot of argument from the nationals when you take either impose higher taxes or uh, move to take a bigger piece of the pie. Um, yeah. So, and, and you can't move the asset. So yeah. they're, they're very happy to see you make the investment, employ their citizens, but when yeah. they feel they're not getting enough, they just arbitrarily step in and say, well, this is the way the world works, fellows. Uh, you own less, or in the case of uh, Santerra, you own nothing. Yeah. Um, and I, I just think that's for countries where they're looking for additional sources of income, it's an easy move. I'd yeah. say right now in South America, the, the shift to the left that's been quite dramatic in Peru and Chile, at least in terms of the rhetoric, uh, has caused Argentina to look more attractive to a number of major players, because yeah. at least they haven't gone that way. They've been slow to adjust their system and they had very cumbersome importation rules, which would slow down mine development. Yeah. But right now they're, they're embracing mining. They want to see that investment um, because of its longer term nature. Yeah, so you are happy with Argentina. You you are not too worried, or well, you always have to be um, watchful, cautious. Okay. But I I'd say um, we're developing our copper project down there right now, and the government's been very accommodating, and they want to see us get <laughs> into production as quickly as possible. Yeah. And when, when could that be possible? <laughs> well, it's going to be a while because right now we're doing, um, we're going to be producing a preliminary fees or a pre feasibility. Um, and then you have to move to a feasibility. So get to the pre feasibility that's um, oh, at the earliest by the end of next year. And then a feasibility study is a year or two beyond that. Then you have to get your permits. And then you have to build. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't see anything happening in the very near term. I'd say, but we're going to be advancing the project, building its value, um, because we're going to be de-risking it, um, having better confidence. But a mine there, cash flow, oh, and an optimistic, I think you're nine years away. Wow, that's a long time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very long. Time. Yeah, but but you want to bring it public? Sp uh, you spin it off from McEwen? You're going to go? Yes. Do a it, it, it's currently in a wholly owned subsidiary. Um, we're in the midst of a financing right now. Uh, we're looking to raise up 60 to $80 million. Um, I've committed. 40 million personally um, and at the at the 80 million uh, McEwen mining would own approximately 70 percent of the new copper company we look to take it public before the end of q3 next year um, what we're doing is building access a new route that will give us 12 month access as opposed to the current five months 
Um, there are two mountain passes that uh, sort of deny us access seven months of the year. And this new route would be lower altitude, give us 12 month access. Uh, we'll be doing 53,000 meters of drilling um, and doing the permitting and the planning for the pre-feasibility study. Um, yeah. Quite excited to see it going ahead. It's been sitting there for a while. And you can, if you look at the 12 major uh, copper transactions, copper properties that occurred from 2010 to 2018, you can see a growth in value as you move from a resource to a pre uh, uh, preliminary economic assessment, then to a pre-feasibility and a feasibility. So there's an incremental growth in value Right now, um, it's valued at about 0.6 of a cent per pound. There's 29 and a half billion pounds of copper there and about five and a half million ounces gold and 191 million ounces silver. But you have that at the pre-feasibility study of those 12, um, one occurred in near the end of 2011, the other occurred in 2017, they were paying um, over 10 cents a pound. And the average feasibility in there was around six cents a pound. So as you de-risk, you improve the value. So McEwen Mining will have a large controlling interest in a deposit that's growing. So if we went to say five cents a pound, well, even three cents a pound, that's just shy of $900 million. I mean, yeah. and five cents a pound, you're a billion and a half. So it's all about improving the access, improving the confidence in the drill results and having the studies and permits to move ahead. So I think that that's relatively short term to get to the pre-fees. So McEwen will have not only a large interest in it, but it'll also have a one and a quarter percent NSR on the property. So it's, I see quite a bit of value coming to McEwen Mining from that. And who is an ideal partner? Besides you will be a, a private investor, I, I guess. Um, you will be a, a larger shareholder and, and you need another partner, right? You said you will commit 40 million. Yes. Who's, who's the other one? Is that a company or is it a private investor then? Ideal. Um, well, right now we, we had a minimum, um, it's a million dollars to invest at the private stage. Um, yeah. And we would expect we'd be raising money in the public issue at a higher price. Yeah. Um, I think of it like a series two financing. Yeah. So you have a, a quite a, like, Kind of private investors then that it's private investors right now uh, okay. we've had this, we've had discussions with some operators and they want to buy too much too soon <sighs> yeah so uh, okay. and uh make make you and mining overall is um is around a dollar and uh you you had now better results. You lowered you lowered the the loss in the last quarter. Uh, I think you pretty much. Um, what happened with the debt? You reduced the debt. No, we refinanced the debt. The debt is um, fifty million dollars. It was to mature this year in August, and in, in the beginning of the year we refinanced it and pushed it out. Uh, till August of 2023 on the maturity of it. Uh, of that debt, I put up half of it. Um, and um, it's sort of like the copper. I saw an opportunity to move ahead and the market was slow to give us anything. And I just said, well, let's get on with this. And so put in the debt and then on the copper, I said, you know, we have money to do our programs with our gold and silver mines, but we don't have enough money to deal with the copper. We've had to issue stock to raise money in the last year when we, our treasury was weak. Um, 
So let's just jumpstart this and get the money in. Yeah. And because the copper mines in Argentina, the seasons are switched. It's lower hemisphere, southern hemisphere. And so you only have a certain time to get into the property. So I said, let's not waste any more time. Let's just yeah. do it. So my, my investment now in the company, McEwen Group, is over 200 million. That's you my cost. 18%, right, of uh, McEwen mining. Yeah. 18. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but the stock price was a little bit disappointing, right? It, it jumped up and down at uh, around a dollar. You, you would have hoped it, it would be much higher, right? <laughs> always, always. Well, it, well, we, you know, since March of 2020, we've outperformed the GDX, we've out, we're performing on par with silver, we're outperformed gold, um, but we were beaten up. Yeah. And what, what was the reason? What, what did go not well? Or why did you get beaten up? Our operations gave us guidance that they didn't meet. Um, the gold bar mine was, had startup problems. And then there was a large write down of its resource. Um, and our treasury was, was weak and we had to do a couple of financings at prices I didn't like, but, uh, we didn't want to breach the covenants of the debt. So, so we went in, worked at gold bar, did a fees, came up with a new feasibility study. Um, we went in, refinanced the debt. And so our cash balance has been growing. Um, the costs at our operations on a per ounce basis have been coming down quite strongly and production has increased. We'll do 20 to 40% more gold than we did last year. So last year we had lower production, higher costs. Yeah. And because production grows, the cost goes down, right? Because of scaling. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, so where is your money invested? And um, you, you said you like mostly like juniors and younger exploration companies. And, uh, but I guess most of your money is invested in the mining industry overall, right? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I was, um, had a big investment in Great Bear, uh, Red Lake, uh, Newfound Gold, um, White Knight, high gold, there are a number of them that uh, maybe a portfolio of 30 companies. 30 companies? Mm. And, uh, and you haven't sold them, right? You, you keep them? Um, I sell some of them when, you know, if you're up 10, 10 X. Um, 10 X? <laughs> it's not bad and you redeploy it somewhere else. I think McEwen Copper will do very well. And that's why one, to get it started, but two, I think, um, there's lots of upside on copper. I mean, it's a, yeah. at, when we did the preliminary economic assessment back in 2017, it used a $3 copper price and it was quite robust. I mean, large capital, 2.4 billion, but an MPV at an 8% discount of 2.2 billion. At current copper prices, using the same discount rate, the NPV is over five billion. Um, and when you look at the electrification of transportation, um, you look at renewable energies and the role of copper in there. You look at the growth in Southeast Asia. Um, barring someone coming up with a substitution for copper. Um, I think copper has a bright future and yeah. sitting on one of the larger undeveloped copper deposits, not owned by a major. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good position to be in. So, so you think the company could be worth MPV 5 billion long-term over the next couple of years then uh, in nine years when you start. Yeah. Theoretically. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the model based on the preliminary economic assessment. So that's, that's more than 10 times. Yes. Uh, how would be the market cap when you are listed? You, uh, how does that work? Like, what, what, well, what do you... 
the financing we're doing right now is at ten dollars a share uh, that would be how many shares do you have then uh there will be currently there assuming we do the full 80 million there'll be 25 and a half million shares outstanding so you have a quarter billion dollar then yes yeah mm -hmm. quarter billion and it could be worth five five billion so okay that's 20 times then uh Mm. There will need to be some investment along the way. Yeah, you have to raise money. Mm -hmm. But but you can see the type of gain that's possible there. Yeah, I guess you look at least for 10 times. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and those companies you mentioned before, those miners, uh, juniors, uh, um, you, you are invested in those right now or? Some of them. Some of them I've sold. Oh. Yeah. Some, okay. I still have some investments, but I have reduced my positions in a number of companies. Yeah, because you needed the the investment now for your own um, McEwen yes. Papa or yes. Mm -hmm. yes, or for other investments. Uh, well, principally there, I see a large gain potential, and um, the other ones have had a a lovely run. So. Um, Time to rotate into the next area of opportunity. Does the taxes not hurt you once you you um, cash out? How is that um, taxation? Well, you, always have to, you always have to sell at some point. Okay. Um, and in in Canada, there was prospects of increasing capital gains tax. So, you know, you want to minimize the bite that the government takes. Yeah. So you did it before. Yes. Mm -hmm. we, they haven't put it in place yet, but our our government just seems to be, they're looking like they're going to call an election in the fall and try to get a clear majority and they can put in their nasty little policies. How, um, in regards to copper mines, um, do they find new resources? You, you mentioned it. Uh, how, how is the, the copper demand and the... And, uh, there's a problem, right? The resources are, we don't find a lot of new resources, even in gold. Really? Yeah. I mean, Goldman Sachs is projecting a fairly large deficit in the copper market. And then, and you just recently, I mean, the automakers are all just saying, whether it's Mercedes or anybody else, General Motors, they're coming out and saying, look, we're going to be producing 50% or 70% of our cars by 2030 is going to be electric. Um, those cars all use over 100 pounds of copper in them. Yeah. Um, that's a big shift in the marketplace. So, yeah. and, and the other complicating, so there's current projections of demand are creating a shortfall. So that would suggest the price is going higher. And then you look at the time it takes to develop a mine of yeah. a size that would have an impact on the copper market. Yeah. Those timelines are getting longer, not shorter. So um, you, you get a squeeze in the price probably. Yeah. And, and they don't find a lot of new resources, right? That's, that's pretty... No. It takes a lot of drilling. Um, yeah. And then some of the gold producers are looking to base metals too. Yeah. They're, they're looking to say, well, where can we get the returns yeah. and the long life? Yeah. I, mean, I, I look at our copper project and maybe it's not the right way to look at it. You're not supposed to add your, your indicated and inferred resources together, but I do it just to get it picture of the size. So we have 29 and a half billion pounds of copper outlined. And I said, well, if you were to take the current gold price and copper price and divide the copper price into the gold price, you have about 480 pounds of copper is equal to one ounce of gold in terms of value. Mm -hmm. um, if you use those same numbers, and divide it into our resource base, this is like a 70 million ounce gold deposit. Yeah. Just to give you, and in the PEA, it's um, the preliminary economic assessment, you're looking 
it modeled uh, we'd be producing in the first 13 years 415 million pounds of copper. So that's using the same numbers, you'd be coming up with just under a million ounces of gold a year equivalent. And the cost was calculated at $1.14 a pound, including gold and silver credits. So that would be just under $500 an ounce. So just to give you this sense of the magnitude of this project. Yeah. So it, it would be on a level of um, Freeport McMoran, like the size, or even bigger than that? I'm not sure what Freeport's production is coming out of Grassburg right now. They had a lot of gold coming out. They produced 2 million ounces of gold a year um, and several, I don't know. They, they produced a lot of gold and, yeah. and copper. I don't think it wouldn't be as profitable as Grassberg, but it would be in, at least according to Goldman, it would be in the uh, first quadrant yeah. quartile for costs. Yeah. Well, why it wouldn't be so profitable? Because you don't have so much gold in it, right? In the, um, it's yeah. mainly yeah. it's uh, dominated by copper, right? Yes. It, it'd be producing, I think, about. 100,000 ounces of gold a year, it's modeled to, 100 yeah. to 150,000. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's and, and how is it with gold? Do they find a lot of new gold resources that are really valuable or is it all stagnating everywhere? Oh, they're still finding gold. I mean, there's some, there's been some pretty hot discovery holes coming yeah. out recently. Um, it's been very exciting to watch. Um, you know, everybody's hasn't been focused on the sector. People have been exploring. They've been getting good drill holes. And the market hasn't been responding. One day, they're suddenly going to wake up and say, where did all this gold come from? Are we going to be producing a lot more than what we do now? I don't think so. We're starting to, we're slightly ahead, but not a lot from where we were a year or two ago. And overall, how is permitting in, in the mining world, like is, is it the same or does it get more difficult with environmental things, politics and what, what do you predict? It, it's more onerous, it's longer, there are more permits, it's more time consuming. Um, very unlike the tech business that has, has grown so rapidly, yeah. but it doesn't have any regulations. Yeah. How do you see the FANG stocks and uh, the speculation within the FANGs? Everyone focuses on, on Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, all that stuff. And uh, they, they went really through the moon and all the other, they, they kind of, I don't know, they, a lot of companies get forgotten and uh, nobody focuses uh, on a lot of other sectors. Investors are generally largely influenced by the media. And these companies are all very active in the media. And then, I mean, they've grown remarkably in a short period of time. So it's exciting how yeah. quickly they've grown. Yeah. But they are also dominating the news channels where, so they've crowded out the other stories. Um, yeah. And again, it goes back to low interest rates and a lot of money floating around in the system. Yeah. Well, what, what happens when the interest rate goes up uh, with gold, usually with the gold price? Well, gold topped out when Volcker raised interest rates in the U.S. to over 18 percent. But gold ran up ran. to 800, 850. Um, the initial response has been, well, if interest rates go up a quarter point, um, that's bad for gold. Uh, but I think if interest rates start moving up, a lot of other investments don't look as attractive. And yeah. having the leverage that's in the market right now, it starts getting curtailed and people are saying, well, maybe there's a reason for looking for something safer. Uh, yeah. Right now, 
people feel, don't feel there's any risk. Yeah. And what is then with the dollar price? Uh, gold is good with a weak dollar, I guess. It has been in the past, yes. Yeah. But how do you see that correlation now? I still think the dollar is going to get weak, but um, I think that relationship will hold up as we've see, seen a strengthening in the dollar with um, the moving interest rates, a small amount. So money's flowing in there because there's not a lot of places where you can get any yield. Um, but at one point, interest rates, if they rise high enough, are a reflection of the lack of confidence in a currency. Mm -hmm. Um, so all I can do is point to history, Tim, and just say, every time anybody, any country has printed the amount of money that we've seen printed recently, that type of increase, um, usually makes the currency of their land weaker, buys less, and you, in local currency terms, the value of gold goes up. Yeah, and inflation, you see it everywhere. All these companies complain when you look at all these food producers or like whatever you take. And uh, they say, we, we, need, we need more. We have to increase the pricing for our goods because yes. the inflation hits us. And, and then it's going across. I mean, there's pressure on wage rates because people are saying food's costing me more, rent's gone up, insurance. All, all sorts of elements of their life yeah. have been moving up and, but they don't seem to be earning much more. Yeah. So it gets harder for- Yes. Yeah, for everyone. Okay. And uh, for a, a retail investor, it's hard to invest in the mining industry, especially in those young juniors or like exploration companies. Uh, like what, what would you, um, a friend like would ask you, you have to be really an insider, otherwise you can really burn a lot of your money, right? It's not that easy. Well, it's when you buy as well. If, if you buy when all the stories in the paper are about how far it's climbed, it's usually too late. Well, to get the largest gain. You know, there's still probably some room, but when all the stories are about gold going to the moon, you, you should be thinking about maybe uh, not going to the moon with it yeah. uh, and selling. And when no one wants it, like right now, I think is a good time to be considering making some purchases. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much, um, Rob. Uh, I appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the next uh, quarters and uh, the spin-off will happen roughly like from the timing point, like. Uh, next, uh, about this time or into September of next year. Next year. We, we, I wanna have the road built, an airstrip approved and more drilling, more permits um, so that we can get people to see it, what we've done and we have improved confidence in the drilling. A lot of the drill holes ended in mineralization. So we'll be testing there, um, see if it goes beyond. Okay. Oh, one more question. Did you invest in a, in a space uh, ship company? Um, because it's one of your interests, right? No, I didn't buy into Virgin Galactic, but my wife and I, oh, probably about six years ago, bought tickets for that flight. But um, I did, well, I do have one on a, it's not doing very well, but it, it was going to do some uh, work on the moon. Okay. Oh, well, which company is it? Is it a private one or a public? A private. 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 Okay. And uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, uh, did they tell you when you are going to uh, fly? Well, it was, it was, it was always after Richard. Um, <laughs> um, we don't have a, a flight schedule yet but it's much closer now and really looking forward to that. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Rob. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Tim. Good to okay. see you. Good to see you. Take All care. All the best. Bye. Yeah, bye.
Nein. Ja, super, dass du so lange hier zugehört hast. Rob McEwen, der ist ein bekannter Bergbauer. Er hat äh, Goldkorb aufgebaut und gegründet, eine der größten Goldminen der Welt. Und dann hat er später Goldkorb verlassen und hat kleinere Firmen aufgebaut. Eine Firma, McEwen Mining, die sind sogar in der New York Stock Exchange gelistet. Er ist der Vorstandschef, der Großaktionär. Er kassiert nur einen Dollar Gehalt, äh, weil er sagt, er ist der Großaktionär und will über die Aktienkursentwicklung profitieren. Allerdings hat die Aktie sich eigentlich sehr schlecht und schwach entwickelt. Das ist schade. Die stehen so rund bei einem Dollar, US-Dollar, die McEwen Mining. Die waren schon deutlich höher und äh, irgendwie kommt der Kurs nicht so recht in Fahrt. Das liegt daran, äh, das ganze Bergbauwesen ist ein ganz schwieriges Geschäft. Du hast auch ständig steigende Kosten für Löhne, du hast steigende Kosten für Energie, das ist sehr, sehr kostenintensiv, eine, Bi eine Mine, ähm, eine Lizenz zu bekommen, die ganzen Bohrungen, die gemacht werden müssen, die ganzen, die ganzen Genehmigungen, die man einholen muss, dann die Errichtung einer Mine, das, das Bauen einer Mine ist schwierig, teuer, manchmal müssen Leitungen gelegt werden, Straßen gebaut werden, das ist alles nicht so einfach, extrem teuer. Und man muss viel vorstrecken, bis dann am Ende das Geld fließt. Und manchmal gibt es natürlich auch Verzögerungen und Probleme. und Also es ist nicht ohne. Deswegen, Minengeschäft ist ein hartes Business. Erstmal kostenintensiv und später steigen einem auch vielleicht die Kosten noch davon durch die ganze Inflation, die man hat. Trotzdem finde ich die Branche interessant. Man kann das dem Depot beimischen, ob das jetzt die McEwen Mining ist oder nicht. Das müsst ihr selbst entscheiden. Und ich habe jetzt keine Anlageempfehlung gemacht, einfach mal so mit einem Mean Manager gesprochen, mit einem Prominenten aus Kanada, aus Toronto, äh, den man so kennt, wenn man sich mit Mean Aktien beschäftigt, mit dem Rob McEwen. Macht's gut, bis die Tage. Ciao.